Welcome to the Stephen McCain podcast, where every week I bring you people doing world class things in the field of human performance and optimization. This week's guest is Stephen Sashin. He is the founder of Zero Shoes. They are a barefoot minimalist shoe company. And you're going to find out why traditional shoes are destroying your feet, posture, your movement patterns, and the science of why barefoot shoes are a better option for us. I'm a proud owner of Zero Shoes, and so that's why I wanted to do this podcast. So let's do this. Stephen, thank you for coming on the podcast. This is the first time I've got to say Stephen right back when someone says Stephen, so that was really fun. Yeah. I mean, mine's with the PH though, right? Yeah. I, look, I'm still friends with you, even though you don't know how to spell your own name. <laughs> well, look, we met at the, uh, the biohacking conference in Los Angeles and we hit it off immediately because I found out very quickly that you were a former gymnast. And so we well, were it's because like, you made some comment about being a gymnast and then I said something about it and then we had a really good chat. And then on, that was on day one. And on day two, I said to you, Hey, look, I got to apologize if I was making my all-American stories sound like they're in any way comparable to your multi-Olympic stories. And you said, are you kidding? It's, it's so rare that I get to talk to someone who understands this stuff at all. This is a blast. And since then, it's all been fine. Yeah, exactly. Because there's this thing that when you get to connect with somebody, especially in this space that was a gymnast, I know your history. I know at least yeah. something about you that is very specific that is very similar to me. I'm happy to always meet a fellow gymnast and you helped me pick out my first pair of zero barefoot shoes. And I'm happy to say I, I've got them on there, there they right are. now. The speed force is I, the way I talk this shoe up about how comfortable it is and how much I love it. I almost feel like people don't believe me. Please don't mess that shoe up. I'm begging you because it oh, is- we're actually, we're making it better. So we have version two coming out a little later. I don't have an exact date. We just made the upper a little more, well, a lot more elegant. We made it a little bit lighter. No, you're going to love it. Soul stays the same. Other things get, get upgraded, which you're going to get a kick out of. Fantastic. What, what are the, what's the color scheme? That's it's complicated because it's not a simple <laughs> answer. So I can't, I can't tell you not because I don't want to, but because I literally can't describe it well enough in words. Got it. Got it. And what, when is that coming out? Sometime in the future is the only thing that I know it's going to be, I I'm not totally sure. I think at the latest this fall, which means August 23 ish, but I don't know. I haven't gotten an exact date from our, our product team yet. Okay. I, I, I'm absolutely ready. I still, every now and, now and then go to your site and I look at the other colors of the ones you have. I'm like, <laughs> ah, should I just go ahead and just buy all of them? <laughs> well, I got to tell you what I did with the new upper. There are a couple people who we, I, I know we know at least one of them in common, but I don't, I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to, uh, they haven't given me permission to do that. But there are a couple people who are very well-known health and fitness people who own over 40 pairs of that shoe. So they just bought them one because, well, both for the same reason. They just wanted to make sure that they wouldn't change. They'd always have a pair. And so when we designed the new upper, I sent a photo to each of them and said, just curious what you think. And they both came back on, oh, I love this. Whew. Okay. Dodged a bullet there. So that gave me the confidence to keep moving forward on that design. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it is. It's unbelievable when you put on a shoe like the Speed Force how comfortable it is. You, it just feels like it's part of your foot. It's yeah. unbelievable. Well, let me highlight a couple of reasons why, just for the fun of it. So yeah. all of our shoes, we start by making a wider foot shaped toe box. So you're not squeezing your toes together. And then it's really low to the ground for balance and agility. We don't elevate your heel or, ele or elevate your toes. Crazy fle flexible, crazy, crazy lightweight. So you get ground feeling. Your brain knows what you're stepping on or stepping in, but also protection and traction et cetera, et cetera. And there was something I was going to say about that. It's funny. We, way back when in 2017, we did an equity crowdfunding raise. So 1,100 people invested in our company. And we thought that they would be the perfect ambassadors. But what happens is people, they'll say, I got these shoes. They're amazing. You got to check them out. And I liked them so much. I invested in the company. And then the people they're talking to kind of go, oh, is this like some multi-level marketing thing? So yeah. It didn't yeah. quite work out the way we expected. Yeah. People, they have a, a radar for that stuff. You know, well, we're like that. I mean, you gave me a flashback. I used to do a lot of long, long meditation courses 
And I would tell people if they did one for their first time, they came back and they'd tell me how much their life had changed. And I would say to them, yeah, just shut up for two weeks. Just wait and see how things settle in. Now, that by the two-week mark is when things settle down a little bit. Maybe they're kind of back to their life. It didn't change as much as they thought. But the good news with what we're doing is it's the exact opposite. After two weeks, three, it just gets better and better and better. So, and the number one thing that has grown our business has been word of mouth. And we're in a very lucky situation. My wife says it best. She's my, our co-founder. She says, there's, there's enough shoe companies in the world. You don't need any more shoe companies unless your shoes change people's lives. And we just hear from people all day, every day who say that because of the comfort you described or because letting your body do what's natural. Cause it's not about the footwear. It's about form. It's about letting your body do what's natural. That can be life-changing for people. They can do things they never did before or do things they haven't done for years. So it's, it's super, super fun to be on the other end of just hearing that. Yeah. Well, when I just, I'm not, I'm not a barefoot shoe expert, but I wear them and I've worn them now for enough time to, to have an opinion, let's say. And mm. I feel like to have a shoe that doesn't box you in, in a way where you, you can't do anything that you would do barefoot practically, right. except, except right. stick something between your toes because your toes are, are <laughs> right. in a shoe, right? But yeah. for me, like I've studied a lot of stability, postural, like helping people fix their, their posture and their movement patterns. And it just seems to me that when you are standing in a shoe that's anatomically more designed to be mm -hmm. like your yeah. foot is, that you are going to have better stability and better movement patterns, better ground connection. You're going to have mo more mobility in the foot. And these things don't fix themselves. So if you right. get a muscle imbalance, like where you're standing in heels, your hips are jacked back. So you have an anterior pelvic tilt, your lower back is arching. So you have lower back pain. Once those things go out of whack, it's not like a cut on your finger where it just heals in two weeks. Yeah. You have to do something to fix that, or it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I think starting with the feet is a great strategy. I really do. And I think not standing on stilts all day long. Yeah. I, I think of it this way. I've said to chiropractors, I go, you get someone on a table, you do some adjustment and everything looks good. Then they put on these shoes that jack up their heels and squeeze their toes together and don't let them feel anything. How can that possibly be good for them? Or like people doing a yoga class, you spend all this time in your bare feet connecting to the ground. And then you go put on a thick pair of shoes where you lose that connection and can't actually use your feet. Your toes can't grip. You can't do any of that. I mean, you don't do push-ups by squeezing your fingers together and having your pinky and your first finger overlapping. That would make no sense. So why are you wearing shoes that could do that? And the simple thing I say to people, because look, a lot of people argue, like to argue with me because human beings don't like having their beliefs challenged. We don't handle that very well. And despite the fact that I'm one of the leading experts on this on the planet, now granted that's undermined by the way I look, but regardless, I say, I just say, let me just ask you some simple questions is weaker better than stronger? And they go, no. I go, okay. If it is immobilizing your body and your joints better than letting them move freely? And they go, no. I go, is making it so you can't feel anything with the nerve endings in your fingers or your lips or your soul, is that better than, see, you know, not being able to feel anything? Is that numb better than being able to get feedback? And they go, no. I go, well, look at your shoes. You can't feel anything through that cushioning. You can't move your foot properly because the sole is so thick. Your toes are all squeezed together. So that's not good. And then just to add on it, if you're elevating your heel, just like you said, that messes with your posture. If you have a thing called toe spring where the shoe is, the toe is jacked up and you can't get your foot flat on the ground, that messes with your, the tendons in your foot when they're dorsiflex like that. Foam, by the way, just breaks down the moment you start to wear it. And so if you have some gait imbalance or some gait problem, that'll get exacerbated as the foam breaks down. Oh, you're going to love this. This tells a, a great story about social media. I'm in the airport and there's a guy in front of me on the little walkway who's wearing big, thick padded shoes, but his feet are like way inverted, massive pronation because the foam was like a wedge sideways now. It had worn out on the inside so fast. And so I took a video of this just showing how bad the foam was on his shoes. And I posted it on Instagram and on Facebook. On Facebook, everyone's like, oh, shoes are going to kill you. On Instagram, everyone's like, you're stop body shaming that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, first of all, I was body, I was shoe shaming. I wasn't body shaming. It was just a guy from the knees down. So oh and how gosh. dare you think that was a guy with those big calves and hairy legs? Exactly.
Yeah, people are very sensitive right now. It's it's an interesting time. But I, I'm look, if you go to the, the shoe store, I don't know what has happened, but in the last few years, I, I cannot get my head wrapped around what is style now with shoes. I mean, I, I be, because they have these massive yeah. like things that are like that are five I, to seven I, I pounds. Could, I, yeah, I can explain it to you. It's really easy. Okay. So okay. there's two there's two parts to it. The first is, well, big shoe companies are, and you'll have to please pardon me if your audience has an issue with language, but I can't say it other than they're lying sacks of shit. Yeah, no, and you can what I mean, talk freely. Okay, good. Okay, they're seriously lying sacks of shit. And I mean, what I mean here, I'm going to do the easiest way of describing that. Sacks of shit to seriously. Seriously, seriously. <laughs> so if you look at the research for information about the cause and cure of running injuries prior to about 1970, there's nothing in the research. But then once the advent of the modern athletic shoe came out, suddenly running injury rates spike and they have not gone down in the last 50 years. 50% of runners and 80% of marathoners get injured every year. And that hasn't changed in 50 years, despite all the quote advances from the big shoe companies. So one shoe company that I would not name if I didn't know how to say the word Nike, they published a study on their website that they did, well, better, they call it an independent study. They designed it, they paid for it, somebody else did it comparing one of their best-selling running shoes to a new shoe they developed. And the way the results were publicized was the new shoe reduced injuries by 52%. But if you look at the numbers on their website, is a 12-week study. In the best-selling shoe, over 30% of the people got injured in 12 weeks. In the new improved shoe, not only 15% did. So if that's the best they can do, after 50 years, something is wrong. I mean, that just yeah. doesn't add up. And what happened is that, so that's part one, is they don't really care about you, is the best way I can put it. Part two, the idea of a big, thick padded shoe came out. Hoka was the first one to really do it about nine, 10 years ago. And if you don't know anything about physics or physiology, it just makes sense. More cushioning must be good. It's actually not. Research shows that cushioning just gets in the way, again, because you can't feel anything through the cushioning. And your brain will actually make your your feet land harder because your brain is trying to get feedback and you can't get enough feedback through the soft soles. There's a woman named Dr. Christine Pollard who did research on padded shoes and found that any amount of padding actually just gets in the way and does not reduce loading forces. But intuitively, if you think about cushioning, you think, well, cushioning must be good. More must be better. Just makes sense in our heads if you don't know anything about these other things. And it feels really good when you put a shoe like that on because it's cradling your foot nicely. Now, we know there are things that we eat that we love that are not good for us. Well, there's things that we feel that we love that are not good for us. You lie on a memory foam mattress, feels great. Lie on it too long, you just get weaker and weaker and weaker. And it's the reason why astronauts come back and they can't stand up for a little while because when you're not using your body, it just atrophies. It's just not rocket science. We know this. We know you put your arm in a cast, it gets weaker. Same thing happens in a shoe that doesn't let your foot move. It gets weaker. But here's the, set, the next part. Shoe companies, by and large, are not very creative and very easy to scare. And the easiest way to scare them is by suggesting that there's a better shoe and they're not making it. So if you think back to the, when the barefoot running movement kicked in in 2009, 2010, the big shoe companies were terrified no one was ever going to buy any one of their products ever again. And so they're putting out all this content about how if you go barefoot, you're going to step on hypodermic needles, you're going to get Ebola, your kids won't get into college, your car won't start, your mortgage rate's going to go up, you won't remember how to use the number three. I mean, it was insane, but that was the best they could do. A year later, they're coming out with what they were calling minimalist or barefoot shoes that were nothing of the sort. And then two years later, they stopped selling those because they couldn't tell two stories. You need a lot of cushioning, you don't need any cushioning. So they just dumped the one that was kind of brand new that people were freaking out about. But what happened with the big cushion shoes is that, well, they could do that. All they have to do is add more cushioning to what they're already doing. So when Hoka started doing well, everyone's freaking out saying, we're never going to sell anything unless we do the same thing. And if you go to a trade show like the one in December called the running event in Austin, every shoe in that, in that show looked exactly the same. Big, thick, honking foam with carbon fiber in between. And here's my favorite part. People think the carbon fiber is doing something for performance. Oh, it acts like a spring. Nah, not a spring. Oh, it acts like a lever. Nope, not a lever. You don't know anything about physics. It's in there because the foam is so unstable 
that if they didn't put a carbon fiber layer in the middle, and they could have used any other material, but carbon fiber is really light and strong. If they didn't put something in the middle, the, the shoe would just fall apart in five seconds. So totally structural, but they all look exactly the same now. So people go, oh, they must be good because everyone's wearing them. No, everyone's wearing them because that's the only thing you can find practically. So it's a bit of a survivorship bias story. Now, the good news, and I'll stop this rant in a second, is when everything's on one side, that's kind of like a pendulum that's swinging and it's gone to as far as it can go. I mean, unless they're going to make a foot full of foot high of foam, and then it's just going to be like the princess and the pea. But maybe things are going to swing the other way. And if you look at the Google Trends search data on barefoot shoes, you can see the initial spike when the boom kicked in in 2009, 2010, but then it faded out because it was a fad then. But what you see is organically, it's been going up and it's almost at the same level that it was in 2009 now. So I say, if the pendulum is going to swing the other way, and it looks like it will, because of what we're seeing with our company and some of our competitors, there's a really interesting opportunity here. And if someone decides to really help us out and put a bunch of money behind what we're doing, someone's going to have first mover advantage and authenticity advantage, and we're going to be poised. Well, let me, let me leave it on this one. There's a bunch of research, bunch of research coming out and that is looking at minimalist footwear using our shoes for a number of different interventions to help with a number of different things, balance in the elderly, balance for people who are paraplegic, improvements for people who are, have single leg amputees for kids with ADD and autism, for people with Parkinson's, and just comfort and performance as well. And when those numbers come out, while most people are not swayed by data, there are certain people for whom that's really important. Like elder, my dad's one of those people who tripped, fell down, broke his hip and died. Ugh. If people are looking to have better balance as they get older, and here's the CDC saying, oh, these shoes will help. That's a different story than just walking up to your random runner and going, hey, these shoes are better for you. And they won't listen to that at all. So the next couple of years are going to be very interesting. Yeah, well, I, I'm rooting for you guys to make a mark and really get the info out there. Tell me if you think this is correct, because I've had this, this hypothesis that there was a, a lot of gymnasts that were popping their Achilles tendon mm. in the last few years. Like, it was like unheard of. Like I was, wow. And I thought, you know what? It's probably because they're standing in shoes all day long with heels because it's shortening the calf muscle and it's tightening it. And I thought if you are standing in a heel all day long and shortening that, and then you go and you do a round of back handspring punch, whatever it is, and you, and you apply all that force at that angle. Yeah. It, your muscles just, it's just the, it's just going to pop. Does it, you think that there's something there? Well, interestingly, that idea is what created the modern athletic shoe. So Bill Barrowman in the early days of Nike was sharing a building with some podiatrists. I can't remember if they were a sports podiatrist or a computer podiatrist. And he came and said, we're getting all these runners who are getting Achilles tendonitis. What do you recommend? And they said, clearly from standing in higher heeled shoes all day, these people have shortened their Achilles. So you need to make a wedged heel, put a wedge of foam in there to accommodate their shortened Achilles. Cut to 30 years later when one of these doctors was at a track meet with a guy that I am friends with who worked directly with Bill Bowerman for decades. And my friend said, your idea has become ubiquitous. Every modern athletic shoe has a wedge of foam in it. What do you think about that? And the doctor says, it was the biggest mistake we ever made. Yeah. We had no evidence for this Achilles shortening idea. We were just making a lot of prosthetics. So we were seeing everything as needing a prosthetic solution, but we see the problems it's created and now it's a big mistake. So the, I can say two things. One, I'm iffy about the Achilles shortening thing, or let me say it slightly differently. I don't think their Achilles has actually shortened. But I do think their brain is telling their Achilles it can only stretch so far. Mm. So do you know anything about Feldenkrais work? Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais. I'll no. describe it for you. Okay. So it's a, it's a body work system, let's say. That's a bad way of putting it. But there's a guy, Moshe Feldenkrais, came to America. And the whole I, a couple of the ideas behind Feldenkrais, if, you have, if your right shoulder is bothering you, you'll go see a practitioner and they're going to spend all this time working on your right shoulder. You go to a Feldenkrais guy and they're going to spend a bunch of time just having you move your left shoulder. It's like, why would you do that? It's my right shoulder that's out of whack. Well, let's just make sure your brain understands how to move your right arm correctly. And then we're going to have you move your, or sorry, your, I'm telling the story. Your right arm is bad, left arm is good. So we're going to work on your left arm. So let's make sure your brain knows how to use your left arm correctly. And then we're going to have it start moving your right arm. And you're going to feel the difference and your brain is going to try and make up the difference and avoid the pain 
because it knows how to do it correctly from the other side. So I see this with people. So I had a, a session with a guy who brought Moshe Feldenkrais to America. And as most gymnasts have shoulders that are messed up. Yeah. And so he's working, I didn't realize this to now, on my right shoulder. And he has me do just like this contraction. He's not trying to stretch it out. He has me contract and, every, and make everything as tight as I can on my right side. Then he gently pulls my right arm and it extends like six inches further than it ever had before. Because my brain just realized that it was safe to make that movement. Mm. And so I think what happens is when you get into a, into a truncated movement pattern, when you only allow yourself to move a little bit, whether the muscles change or not, I'm, I don't know, but your brain definitely gets the hint, oh, that's the range that we're supposed to work in. And so I think that could be part of that. And your brain is really, really heavily wired to protect you from what it thinks is dangerous. Yeah. So there's an idea from Tim Noakes called the central governor theory, that your brain is constantly trying to keep you from doing too much. And this shows up for endurance runners in particular, where you start getting signals like, oh, I got to slow down. And what endurance runners often learn to do is reframe those messages as, oh, this is when I got to push harder or just ignore them. Or yeah. the, the central governor gets the hint that you can actually do more than it originally thought. So when I see people running in shoes with big high heels and they're landing on their midfoot underneath their center of mass, just the way they could, but even with the big thick heel, they're not letting their heel come all the way to the ground, which makes no sense. I'm firmly convinced that if you put them on a table and check the range of motion in their ankle, that it would be restricted. But if you did some little Feldenkrais thing and faked them out, they'd, you'd find that they actually still had full range of motion, but their brain just isn't letting them do it normally. That's my theory. It hasn't been proven yet. Interesting. So it's like you're artificially, you know, handicapping your, your yeah. movement or extensibility, like the, the range. Well, well here's, a here's a variation on that that I just thought of. We know that doing isometrics can build strength, but especially in the play, in the range where you're doing the isometric, it doesn't necessarily translate to range of motion. So if someone is just standing in a limited range of motion, it could be something just like doing isometrics. Yeah. If you look at people that sit all day, your hip flexors, so your erectus femoris, your tensor fascia latte, your uh, psoas. Hey, it's okay if I talk dirty. It's not okay if you see, use words <laughs> like erectus. <laughs> Oh, I love it. We're, I mean, we're friends, but we're not that close. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the, these things shorten and then the backside turns off. Talking about my backside. Hey, my back God, Stephen. Jesus. What's going on here? here? But let, let me ask you this. When somebody buys their first pair of barefoot shoes, they are probably going to experience the turning on or usage of a lot of muscles in their lower leg. It's like their anterior tibialis and things like that that they didn't. Right. Like my yeah. life, my legs got sore. Like I was like, wow, yeah. below my knees. Cause I didn't realize how much more I'm using my foot in a barefoot shoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're definitely going to be using muscles that you haven't used the way they're supposed to be used in quite a while. And I like to say that calf pain is optional. So the, what I like to say is if you haven't been to the gym for a long time, you don't go back and just do the same workout you did when you were six months ago or a year ago or 10 years ago, you start slow. You do one set with a weight that you're embarrassed to lift because it's so light. And then you see how you feel the next day and you're shocked that you're still sore. And then you wait till you're not sore. You go back and do it again. You just do that same set until you can do that comfortably, until you feel fine the next day and the day after. And then you go and you add a rep or you add a little weight or you add a set, whatever's appropriate. Same thing. If you haven't used the muscles in your feet and legs properly, you want to start slowly. And it's different if you're walking or standing versus running. If you're just Standing, you can probably go a little longer. If you're walking, you can go a little less than standing. If you're running, you want to do much less than that. But you want to use your, you, you want to just use the feedback you're getting from your body to figure out how to move correctly. The, the joke is you don't want to do too much too soon, but the only way you know you've done too much too soon is by doing too much too soon. So I just tell people start really, really slow. If you're running, 30 seconds tops. If you're walking, maybe half an hour, hour. If you're just standing, maybe an hour, hour and a half, and just see how you feel and just use that as a guide. The good news about this is that if you follow that mm, idiosyncratic, totally personalized way of figuring out how to make the transition by listening to how you feel, you're becoming your own coach. My wife loves to say, our shoes are not a medical device, even though we have people who talk about medical improvements, they're a coach and they allow you to do what's natural. And when you can listen to yourself instead of looking to someone else for a 
p- cookie putter, cookie putter, cookie cutter <laughs> method of doing whatever. I don't know where that goes. Then that's a much better thing to be able to trust yourself than to look externally for something that it doesn't make sense. My favorite thing about that, people will watch some race and they see Elliot Kipchoge, the guy that ran the sub two hour marathon, he's wearing some particular pair of shoes and they go, oh, I got to get those shoes. Well, guess what? You're not Elliot Kipchoge. You're not running a marathon at two hours or slightly more, slightly less. You're not a five foot, 205 pound Kenyan running at that speed. So why are you paying any attention to what that guy does? It, it's sort of amazing. Like I, I was thinking about it this way. When Roger Bannister broke the four hour mile, everyone's, and then a week later, everyone else is breaking the four hour mile. They're all saying, oh, it was all psychological. No one said it was because of his shoes, but for the last 50 years, it's always because of the shoes. It's not Elliot Kipchoge after he ran the sub two marathon and Nike is promoting that, like it's the shoes. He, he came out and said, it was my legs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let me, well, let me ask you this. I'm sure certain people are a little bit concerned runners when they are going to take the plunge and try to run in a barefoot shoe. Yeah. Is it safe? Is it sort of like what you said? You got to take it in a measured approach. Is there a different? Well, two, well, it kind of it kind of depends. If you're a sprinter or a middle distance runner, you've basically been wearing a barefoot shoe already. A running running flat or racing flat is pretty damn close. Not exactly the same. Usually not foot shaped. Usually has too much arch support. Usually has a little too much cushioning. But it's pretty damn close. But for runners, again, you want to just do one run, twenty or thirty seconds, see how you feel the next day, and then when you feel better, build up on that one run per week that you're doing until that feels comfortable and you're doing your normal mileage on that day and then start adding some in for the rest of the week. Or once you start feeling comfortable with some amount of time and distance in that first run, then add a little bit into your next runs. You want to titrate it. You want to just, there's no rush. Here's the analogy I like to use. If you've broken your arm and it's in a cast for eight weeks, amazingly, it doesn't come out stronger. It comes out pretty weak and you need to do one of two things. Either keep it in a sling and never use it again, or do some PT and use your arm again. And in a little while, you will build it back and you can use your arm for the rest of your life. Well, it's the same thing if you haven't been using your feet. You want to start slow, but if it takes you a few weeks, a couple months, where's the downside for that? If building stronger feet, that could improve your power, your performance, your balance, your agility. If that could keep your feet supporting you for the rest of your life, why wouldn't you do this effortless thing of building up some strength by wearing a shoe that lets your foot do its natural? Now, Related to that, I've got an ebook coming out in hopefully a week that talks about two interesting pieces of research. The first is from Dr. Sacco in Brazil, where in her lab, they took a bunch of runners in regular shoes and they had them do an intervention. I'll mention it in a second. And they tracked the runners who did this intervention against the ones who didn't. And over the course of a year, the ones who did this intervention had 250% fewer injuries than the ones who did. Now, there was no, no one had no injuries. So it's reducing your risk of injury by 250% over the course of a year. And it was pretty consistent throughout the entire year. Well, the intervention was a very simple foot exercise program. It took about eight, took eight weeks, takes a few minutes a day. They did some of it with a physical therapist, some of it at home, but it, pretty straightforward. It's building what many people refer to as your foot core. You've got your abs for your abs, your, that's your core. Your foot core is all those muscles and intrinsic and extrinsic muscles around your foot and ankle. So, that's pit of research number one. But I know that if you tell that to most people, they're going to go, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do an exercise program. Even if it takes five minutes a day, you can do it while you're watching TV. Well, the good news is there's another piece of research from Dr. Ridge who showed that just walking in a minimalist shoe, and she used a different shoe than ours, but said that ours should give the same benefits. Just walking in a minimalist shoe built foot strength as much as doing the exercise program. So there isn't a study yet that shows that if you just walk in our shoes, you reduce your injury rate by 250% over the course of a year if you're running in whatever you want. But let's do the math. Walking in minimal shoes, build foot strength as much as doing an exercise program. The exercise program reduced injury risk by 250%. So that's another option that I say to people. Look, if you're happy in your shoes, great, wear them. But then wear ours when you're done running so that you're building that strength and everything else to give to make you better. And here's my favorite example for that. We have a, an Olympic ice hockey player who swears by our shoes. She doesn't skate in them, obviously. She's skating in skates. But she says, when I get out of my skates, when my feet have gotten weak by being in my skates for hours a day, I put on your shoes. That's helping me. And it's actually making me skate better. I'm jumping better when I'm in my skates in particular. I'm just faster when I'm getting started because her feet and ankles are working better. 
So that's like the most extreme example of wearing casts on your feet, but then having the benefit of using your feet naturally. Same thing, actually, we had a, a WNBA player who reached out to us saying, I've been wearing your sandals when I get off the court and my feet and ankles have become indestructible. And so you guys should make a basketball shoe. I said, funny you should mention that. Here's a basketball shoe. And we gave her something we'd been testing. And she came back and said, yeah, they don't fit me quite right. But nonetheless, I couldn't sprain my ankle on these if you paid me to. So wow. there's, all, there's a time and place. I'm not going to tell people that they should do only one thing all the time, even though they should only do one thing all the time. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I want to meet people where they are. And it's easy to do that because look, again, is weaker better than stronger? No. Is immobilizing your body better than moving it? No. Is not feeling anything better than feeling anything? No. So give yourself the opportunity to let your body do its natural as often as you can, as much as you can, with the protection that you want, with the grip that you want. And then if you're going to do some wacky other thing, if you're shoving your shoes into an ice skate or a ski boot or a climbing shoe or whatever else it is, or a high heel, there's actually someone who did a course on how to wear high heels. And it was mostly a foot strengthening course. So it's like you strengthen your feet. So for those couple hours you need to wear heels, you can tolerate it. Interesting. Well, I mean, look, to have it, to wear a barefoot shoe and it to be the equivalent of a exercise program for your feet, I would just like to add that barefoot shoes are incredibly comfortable. Yes. But it's not like you're putting on this shoe that's like, oh my God, this is so painful and hard to walk. It is, I leave them on. You forget at least the speed force. And I have a couple other pairs of your, your yeah. stuff that I've tested out, which I love, but I'm always wearing my speed forces and I'll be around the house late at night and I'll be like, oh, I haven't even taken off my shoes because yeah. I don't realize that I have shoes on. Yeah. You know, we've had people, we've had people report that they accidentally went to bed still wearing their shoes. <laughs> yeah. I know, that sounds ridiculous, but I believe it. I know. I, no, we, you know. we've had, we had one, a guy working for us, a sales guy, he's at a trade show and he takes a lunch break and he's finishing lunch and he's thinking, I better get back to the booth. I better put my shoes back on. And he looks down, they're still on. That's hilarious. Yeah. I spoke at a conference. I dressed up really nice. I had these boots. They were made by Saint Laurent. They're like this French mm -hmm. super high-end boot. It's like this really like prominent heel. It looks like a traditional European old world boot. Very nice, beautiful. And then after the conference, I'm going to this mixer event and I'm talking to people and I'm like, I can't stand in these things anymore. <laughs> I literally took them off and had them in my hand and I'm standing in my socks at this event. Yeah. And I, it, I can wear those shoes, but it, it's only for a measured amount of time. And it's not yeah. like I'm some weakling. It's just after a while, you start to feel the damage that you're doing. Yeah. yeah. You know, my wife used to said one day years ago, she said, I'm really upset that we own this company. I said, why? She goes, because I need like a nice pair of brown boots and I found one, but they have a quarter inch heel. And when I wear them, I feel like I'm going to fall on my face. Yeah. So happily, we now have boots that she can happily wear. So yeah, once you get used to doing what's natural, you can't go back. It's a funny thing. This happened at a trade show. I was getting interviewed by some guys for a big deal magazine. And I said, before we talk, put on our shoes. So you have the experience as we're having this conversation. So we talked for about a half an hour. Then they had to go. They, they start putting on their regular shoes. And I said, how do you feel? And they went, oh my God, these are horrible. <laughs> and, and, said, and you didn't know before, did you? He goes, no, we had no idea. I talked to this guy a while ago and he had this device. I think it was called the Juvant. It's like a micro, like a vibration <laughs> plate that's a yeah. micro one. And yeah. he said, essentially, when you walk, and he said, no one walks barefoot anymore. So they're all in these fo this foam. Mm -hmm. But he said that low impact where your mm -hmm. foot is striking the ground over like thousands of times a day actually kicks off a signal to produce stem cells. And so he said, oh, you could stand on this plate and you could get that same, like you walked 15,000 steps in a matter of 10 minutes. And I thought that was really interesting, but then I also um, thought, what if I'm wearing barefoot shoes all day long? Exactly. Yeah. That's sort of like way back when, and this happens every couple of years, some researcher comes out with something where they're showing an improvement in mobility for people with Parkinson's or people with muscular dystrophy or, mus or, or multiple sclerosis or various other things. And the devices are all the same. They're basically vibration things. They vibrate your feet, they vibrate your ankles, but it's basically vibrating your feet. And the first time I saw one of these pieces of research, I wrote a blog post that was basically saying, 
You don't need the magic vibrating insoles. Just take off your shoes and go for a damn walk outside. This is before we actually had shoes. We were just making sandals at the time. Anyway, I got an email from a guy. He said, I'm 82 years old. I was looking for the magic vibrating insoles. I couldn't find them, but I found your blog post. And since I couldn't find the insoles, I thought I'd put your theory to the test. And that was two weeks ago. And I just threw away my walker. So oh, wow. I don't know about the, but this is just the same as getting 15,000 steps part. That could be just a sales pitch. I have no idea. But yeah, to your point, just take off your damn shoes. You don't need to spend a whole bunch of money. My favorite version of this is a customer came, well, someone came in, became a customer and put on our shoes and was walking around inside our office and outside our office. And outside, we got a little rock garden thing. And he's saying, I can feel this crack in the sidewalk. I've been on this particular spot before. I, I can feel that rock and it's like a foot massage. And he's going on and on about all the things that he could feel, which was a big deal because he's blind. And I... I apologized. I said, I, I feel like an idiot that it didn't occur to me that this would be really good for people who are blind. And so a, a, a lot can be addressed by just, again, doing what's natural. You don't need a big, expensive, high-tech intervention. Yeah, totally. Again, your foot, you're born with your foot the way it was supposed to be in order for the maximal functionability, if that's even a word. Yeah. So why... Why hamper yourself with cramming your foot in a cast? Well, I let's mean, back, let's let's back up though. So uh, again, we have to we have to think about these brilliant and by brilliant, I'm using the word brilliant as a euphemism for douchebag marketers. And what I what I'm referring to specifically is something like arch support. Now, there's time and a place for things, but arch support in orthotics were never never designed to be something you wear all day, every day. They were designed to be like a cast that you would put on your arm if you break your arm. It's a cast for your foot if your foot needs to not be using muscles, ligaments, and tendons while it recovers, while it heals. But then some doctors realized they could make a boatload of money by prescribing them for everything that ails you. <clears throat> and you would never, if you had a whiplash accident or got whiplash from an accident, you would never think that you're supposed to wear that neck brace for the rest of your life, you'd think you wear it until you get healed. And when you go to the physical therapist, they have you take it off and do as much motion as you can and as much strengthening as makes sense without being in pain. Why instead do you immobilize your foot for ankle, knee, hip, back, neck injuries? Yeah. So that was actually the big realization that Dr. Irene Davis, who's now the president of the American College of Sports Medicine, who was teaching physical therapists, she had that realization. And from just thinking when we, when someone comes into a physical therapy office, we try to get them moving and strengthening as much as they can, given their condition, rather than continue to be immobile. Why are we immobilizing their feet? And from that, she started investigating more and she became one of the preeminent researchers on natural movement in the world. And her research is incredible and has inspired hundreds and hundreds of other people to look into this idea. Look, all the research that we're talking about, I call it the dumbest science ever done. <laughs> because all it's proving is something we all know, use it or lose it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's fascinating that it's, it's really sometimes how we just overlook obvious things. Another example of something like that is the knees over toe guy. Nobody oh, yeah. knows why everyone said, don't, don't ever put your knees over your toes. And he yeah. said, we've just been conditioned, but really we should be able to do that. I think it's yeah. the same thing with the shoes. It, it, it is. Here's one you're going to, and I'll see if you come up with the, the analogy or the answer that I come up with. People love to say to me, yeah, but we didn't evolve to run on pavement for hundreds of miles. How would you, I'll, I'll give you a hint. How would you as a gymnast respond to that? It's about, well, I would, would gymnasts are all about technique. It's yeah, about I'll get, having, you're, having I'll, the right You're technique. on the right track, but I'll make your life easier. Okay. I say we didn't evolve to do double twisting, double backs either. Yeah, that's, that's a great way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we there's things but that I we, can still do those. I, exactly, <laughs> I can do uh, double I, twisting, double AI. <laughs> yeah, I can't do double doubles, but I did. But uh, you know, you saw me do my 61 year old standing back. So. That's right. That's so right. There, there is that. But you know, there's a lot of things that we can do that we're equipped to do, totally fine. That we didn't learn to do when we were in the savanna in Africa. It, 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 the fact that we didn't that we didn't evolve doing something doesn't mean we can't do it. But there are things that are kind of dumb. We didn't evolve to fly fighter jets. We didn't evolve to use cell phones. We didn't evolve to do many, many, many things that we just do on a regular basis without a problem. And besides, yeah. if you actually go to the places where we did evolve, 
those surfaces pack mud. It's as hard as concrete with a whole bunch of stuff sticking out of it that you wouldn't want to step on or in. So you would never, if you go to a, to a place, like if you go to the Australian Outback and watch the Aborigines running around in bare feet, you would never want to do the same thing because you're not equipped to do that. And then people say, well, but that's the thing. They've been doing it since they were kids. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't learn something new. That doesn't mean your body doesn't adapt. We know that 90-year-olds yeah. who do strength training programs get stronger. So a lot of people, people just cling to what they believe very, very hard. And, yeah, and they um, won't know why they believe it. They just get bullheaded. And most people run in an oval, so they're like falling <laughs> on their knees. And rather than running in a circle, your, your feet should be like roadrunner so that you're just yeah. striking the foot in the ground in a circle, not landing on your foot. Yeah, the image, that's exactly the image I use. You don't want to land on your foot. You want your foot to touch the ground at the speed that you're moving across the ground. Exactly. So one image I give is, think about Fred Flintstone starting his car. His feet are behind him, just like spinning in a circle. Just try that. You can't actually do that. You can't run with your feet behind you. But sometimes you need to exaggerate the correct way of doing it. Sometimes you need to exaggerate the wrong way too. So yeah. I say overstride more, reach your feet out even more, do it wrong so you can feel what you're talking about because you've acclimated, you've habituated to the way you do it. You need just to get feedback about other options in order to make change. Yeah. I have a true form treadmill. You know those? Oh, I love those. Yeah. Amazing. It's a tank. Got it during, during the pandemic just to put some miles on, but it, it really retrained my gait because it's, yeah. it's a curved treadmill and you, it forces you. Well, it's to, not motorized too. That's the yeah. other part. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really hard. I mean, even just walking on that at a moderate pace is, will put you like in a zone two cardio. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. And that thing, running on that really fixed my gait. It, it, I activate my glutes more. My, my gait is yeah. more circular. It, they're yeah. amazing. There's, there's a, a doctor slash marathon runner, a very accomplished marathoner named Mark Cucuzella, who's got a, who also, in addition to being a doctor and in the Air Force, he owns a running shoe store that focuses on minimalist footwear. And I said, how do you train people? And he goes, I put them on a true form and then I take them off the true form. Yeah, That's exactly. It. You, you start to get, so the way we learn new movement patterns, this is my research when I was at Duke University, is you, you have to slowly do it so you get enough feedback that you can feel it and you'll feel that you're incompetent and you're not doing it right and it's awkward and you get frustrated. Frustration is misinterpreted. That's just the feeling that comes along with trying to lay down new neural pathways and get out of old ones because you notice that you can try something and it's frustrating, then you don't do it for a couple of days and you come back and you're better. It's like, how did mm -hmm. that happen? Well, it's because your brain laid down some new neural pathways. It takes a little while. So you do it slowly and you get the feedback and then slowly you're able to build up speed and you get more until it, and then you're, you're, you're still thinking about it, but after a little while of doing it, when you've laid down those new neural pathways, it just becomes ingrained and that's just the way you are and you've got a new thing. Yeah. That's exactly what gymnastics is like. I used to always tell people gymnastics is like learning a thousand golf swings. <laughs> you know how much people put into a golf swing. I mean, you have so many different six apparatuses as a guy, and then you have all this technique and that you've got to learn and it takes time it, it, and you've got to train ridiculous hours and deal with frustration and, and months and months of learning like a high level skill. Oh, and, look, you know, even learning low level skills. I remember yeah. in junior high school doing the junior high compulsory or floor routine. One part, you had to put your arms parallel to the ground. And it took us weeks to learn what parallel to the ground was because the way it felt and looked from your perspective is not the way it actually is. If you put your arm, most people, you say, put your arm parallel to the ground and it's way up in the air. It's not even close to parallel. And yeah. then you move their arm parallel and they go, no, now I'm pointing to the ground. So, no, that's just the way it looks from your eyes, which are eight inches above your arm. Yeah. And if you don't learn the basics, if you don't master them, You'll never yeah. be able to learn the high level stuff because everything stacks. All the technique oh. just keeps building and building on itself. You just gave me a horrible memory. One summer, so I'm winning every meet that I'm in from in junior high and I get into high school, I'm winning every meet. And my coach says, you got some, you got some issues that are going to make it harder to keep progressing. So for this summer on floor, you're going to do nothing but round offs until I'm happy with how you're doing them. And I was like, are you kidding me, man? I mean, I'm trying to become an All-American. He goes, yeah, nothing but roundoffs all summer. <laughs> and I did. And then the next season, my scores were two points higher. Yep. Yeah. Even when I was the best gymnast I ever was at living at the Olympic Training Center, 
world class, competing all over the world, Olympian. I came in and did 10 round offs on a line mm -hmm. into the mat in the pit where they kind of over rotated. I started my workout with 10 round offs and I ended with 10 round offs because I, <laughs> I was like, it has to be a laser. It's got to be it's so scales. precise. It's the gymnastics version of doing mm -hmm. scales on yeah. the piano. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's really kind of, I think when you, when you get to the highest level, it's, you've just conditioned your brain. Like people are like, what is it? How do you become an Olympian? I was like, well, you just become so fanatical about something that you have an, a mental architecture where you've sliced mm -hmm. diced a, a sport up in so many ways. And you have these little drills and habits and everything that you've woven into your days and you never take any days off. And you've done that for right. 20 years. You're going to be great in it. You know, that, that you'll be good at anything if you do that. Did you, have, did you have little things? This is a thing that we did while we we're in class, junior high and high school, is we would sit at our desks and point our toes and have our toes underneath. So we're just getting into the habit of continually pointing our toes. Did you, have, did you ever do anything like that? I've, I've done versions of something like that. Yeah. Pointing your toes is one of those things when you actually, you learn how important it is when someone gives you a picture of you doing an amazing skill. You're flying in the air and you look like you have cowboy boots on because you didn't point your toes. <laughs> yeah. You're like, God, dang it. That picture would have been perfect. You well, know, for here's, me. here's another one. This is another one. During practice, if we're on any apparatus, didn't make a difference, and you miss a move, you creep out, you fall on your face, whatever it is, we were not allowed to have any expression. We were not allowed to say anything. We're not allowed to do anything. It was just like, just get back up. And so how come, man? So because what's going to happen is someday in competition, you're going to fall off the pommel horse, and without even knowing, you're going to go, ah, motherfucker. And yeah. so this is training you not to do shit like that. Yeah. I mean, you have to learn to manage your emotions. That is what yeah. separates the men from the boys in sports or the girls from the women. For me, when I was trying to make my first Olympic team, I literally, before the trials, I said to myself, if I fall on an event during the trials mm -hmm. process, as long as I don't let it affect me emotionally, if I could just divorce myself from it, it is physically impossible for me to fall again. It's <laughs> not in the mathematics because I have, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no way I don't miss there's no, for me to miss two times in a competition at the level I was at was Doesn't happen. beyond three standard deviations beyond the, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, it gave me a lot. Sometimes you have to just trick your mind into not getting emotional because your emotions in the heat of the moment will just ruin you. They really here's, will. Here's a weird variation of that. So I did stand up comedy for a living for 10 years. Same thing. So as a new stand-up comic, you just go on an emotional roller coaster from a gig that goes really well. And the worst thing that can happen is your first set it goes really well because then your next one is going to bomb horribly yeah, and you won't right. be able to handle it. Yeah. So you just go on this roller coaster from elation to bombing and, and just depression over and over and over. And you eventually learn you know, what the difference is between when you're not funny or when the audience isn't the right audience. Because most comics, early on, they blame the audience, but it's you. Yeah. And so there's a like comic early young comics, they like, they do a joke. It doesn't land. And they like to go yeah, and they pass their hand over their head. Like it went over their head and us older comics would go, no, it's more like this. <laughs> it hit them right in the head. And then it fell on the ground because it wasn't funny. And so you eventually learn that. And then you eventually just stop caring to try to make them like you and make them think you're funny. And that's when it gets better. And then when it doesn't go well, and it doesn't go well for everybody at some point, it's, oh, that was just one of those things where it bombed. And the other part that kind of makes it fun is every other comic who's watching you is having the greatest time of their life watching you bomb. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a lot of performing in my life. And the one thing that would probably make me the most nervous would be to walk out and do stand-up comedy. Do you know Raj Babzar? Yeah. So he, if for all of you listening, he, he was an Olympian. I mean, he and I traveled around the world together. He's an Olympic medalist, awesome gymnast, good friend of mine. He lives in LA and took a uh, stand-up comedy class. And yeah. he invited me to his graduation thing where it's like all the students are going to do it. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll go watch this thing that sucks, but I'll go because I'll support you. <laughs> And I went there and you forget living in Hollywood, Los Angeles, there are some amazing teachers there. They were all amazing. They <laughs> were structured down and they had drilled it so much that 
they all got out there and they kicked ass and I was so impressed. And, but I, I just, I still am like, that would be very nerve wracking to go up and, and do stand up. I think I would like it, but cause when I get on stage, I feel normal. Like I finally, I'm like, yeah. Oh, here I am. I feel I'm never nervous anymore, but for comedy, mm. that's different. Oh, that's what, well, it's just, again, it's just experience. I mean, the thing that comedy engenders is a certain fearlessness because you basically know you can handle whatever happens. Not that you're going to be perfect mm -hmm. every time, but whatever happens, you'll be able to handle it. And that's a really enjoyable place to be. I'm, I'm kind of unassailable because, yeah. and, and even if someone's being insulting, like when we were, when we were in Shark Tank, at one point, Kevin says, we had made an offer. He turned it down and made a stupid offer that we rejected. And he, and he says, ah, you're crazy. And my only response is something like, maybe. I mean, yeah. there's nothing you could say about me that's critical about me that I can't find that I've thought that sometime. So we agree sometimes, if not all the time. So I'm not going to argue with things like that. So you can't insult me personally. So that's, that's easy. And then if, I, if I'm stumped by something, I'm going to say something like, I don't know. Because what do I care if I don't know? I'll go find out. Yeah, There's just exactly. no reason. Yeah, it's just you become, it's an improv thing. You're just willing to roll with it because you've experienced so many times that the worst that could happen is no big deal and almost never happens anyway. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think that we all could use a little bit of some resiliency in our life, especially given the kind of air that we live in right now where everyone is snapping back and forth at each other. I, I think it's a really good quality to have. So if anybody's out there considering doing some stand-up comedy, go for it. <laughs> have enough fun. What's the worst that can happen? A few people that you will never see again will have an unpleasant thought about you that they will forget at some point. This, might, this is a Shark Tank lesson. I know people who've been on the show who bit it badly. And what happens after a couple of years is people will say, Hey, weren't you on Shark Tank? And they go, yeah. And they go, ah, that's really cool. They have no memory of what they saw you do on the show. They don't remember that you bit it. They don't remember that it didn't go well. They just remember that they saw you. And yeah. that's, and that's the way it is most of the time. More often than not, people don't, they're not paying attention to you. They don't know who you are. They're not going to remember you. So it's no big deal. And it's fun to go experiment with that. Yeah. I've landed on my head in front of tens, 10,000 people in a major competition on a stage. I remember one time I went and saw some performer, really good guitarist. And, and I was telling my girlfriend at the time, I said, amazing, right? But that person has made every mistake possible. He's broken oh, yeah. a string in front of people. His guitar has gone out of tune. He's screwed up. The sound didn't work. That's how you get good. You make mistakes. You fall yeah. on your face over well, no, and over and over and over. It's more that you stand back up as fast as you can. So I guarantee that that guitarist, if you asked him about the set, he would tell you about all the mistakes he made that you did not even know happened. Exactly. Well, that's when you reach the elite status, you know, like when you do a, a routine that looks perfect. And yet you were like, I made 10 mistakes in that, that no one knew about. Yeah. And here's a lesson for that. So in addition to stand-up comedy for a while, I was a street performer for many years, actually. And I was in a, so my senior year in college, I took a, I was a psychology major. I took a class that was group counseling. Now it wasn't a class about, it was a class about group counseling, but it was also just an excuse to get eight seniors into therapy. And it was super, super fun. And one day we're in class and a woman in the class says to me, Hey, I saw your street act at that street fair last weekend. And it was really great. And I said, Oh, wait, which show did you see? Cause one of them was really good. And the other, and the therapist stops me. He goes, Oh, hold on. Do you always have a hard time taking a compliment? And I went, well, I, oh man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he goes, Try this one. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It didn't matter which one they saw. They enjoyed it. They and liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I, so. I, I, I took theater for three and a half years and that was one of the lessons they said, listen, if someone gives you a compliment, don't be that person that's like, well, I, 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 this or that, right. uh, just, just like, take it. Just appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, you're, the better you are, the more critical you are of yourself anyways, because you have oh, more of yourself invested in it. And so you're more critical. And so it, it's all part of learning how to be a, a top performer. You well, know, I think to that point, I think there's a way of being aware of the problems or the errors or the whatever without being critical, without having a derivative layer of beating yourself up. You can yeah. acknowledge, here, here, here's the way I do it on the track. So show up at a track meet and at the end of a race, people come out, they, how'd you do? 
And my answer now is, are you just looking for the number or can I give you the excuse first? <laughs> and, and I say it mostly because that's what we all do. Because you ask any, any track athlete, how'd the race go? The first thing they're going to say is, well, I didn't get out of the blocks really well, or my transition phase wasn't good or whatever. It's like, how'd you do? Well, I mean, I set an American record, but. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to be critical of yourself when you invest your time and effort and years into something and well but we're wired we are literally wired to be critical that's what kept us alive way back when back when we you know when we evolved to not do double twisting double backs and <laughs> and and so we're we're built to do that we you go on a first date with someone and what do you talk about all the things that were screwed up in your previous relationships we bond over problems we're hypercritical because we can't look into a glass of water and see if there's bacteria that will kill us so we have to be hypersensitive to our body so this is just the way we're built but if you just investigate that, it doesn't have to become a problem. It's a bug or it's a feature, not a bug. So yeah, yeah I, I had someone make some comment to me once about, oh, I know what it was. We're taking a walk and she said, I'm just trying to listen to my body better so I know what to eat. And I just fell on the ground laughing. And, and she's what? I said, well, first of all, I know what your body wants to eat. Uh, ice cream, French fries, chocolate cake. That's easy. I mean, we want calories. We want something that's enjoyable. That's, yeah. that's no big deal. You think you can do this thing called listening to your body. I don't know what the hell that means. And then it's going to tell you to eat something that you probably don't want to eat right now. And you hope that you're going to like it because now your body told you. But more importantly, you think that if you eat that, it's going to change your body so that when you look in the mirror, you're going to look what you see. Well, I've got news for you. Go ask anybody in the world if they like what they see when they look in a mirror. And if you can find one, I'll give you a million dollars. We're not yeah. wired for that. We're wired yeah. to look. And even if we like parts, we're going to go, that part's great, but there's this thing. If I could just yeah. do this thing. And if you don't make a deal out of it, then that's just the thing you do. When I roll out of bed in the morning, the first thing I do is I check to see if I check to see what my abdominal fat is like. You do. As if I somehow ran a marathon <laughs> while I was asleep and didn't know it. And I find it as funny as you do. I find it hysterical that that's this thing that I do and I can't seem to stop it. And I just think it's a riot that, that I'm a little great. hypersensitive. I'm not even hypersensitive. It's just like, because I'm not doing anything about it. I'm not going on some diet and doing a whole bunch of working out because I don't have time anyway. So why am I checking to see if my body composition changed in the last seven hours? That's hilarious. If I am really honest and I think about my day, I'm doing that stuff all the time. I mean, I'm constantly <laughs> doing it because I do do a lot of stuff for my health and my, yeah. my vanity and things like that. So. I try a lot of things. And so I'm kind of always looking, is it having a result? And what is it yeah. doing? And how do I feel? And, oh, look at that. But you're right. Like you can have this beautiful person and they look in the mirror and all they see is that one thing about their nose or their hairline yeah. or something. And, and it's kind of a shame sometimes because really when you look back on your life, you might have been so critical at a certain point. And then you look 20 years later, you look at a picture of yourself and go, oh my God, I was beautiful back then. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. didn't think you were back then. You were sitting there talking about your nose the whole time or yeah. whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, I can tell you the... I can tell you as I'm approaching 61, the aging thing and the way and perception, it's so weird. And, and I, what, I did something with my wife the other day that I'm not allowed to talk about, but I'm not talking about that. There was, I did something where I, I made some comment or I told her about there's something that I noticed about, I don't know, my eye or my, so I had some eye surgery recently and I, there was something going on about with my eye afterwards that I was very aware of. And I mentioned it to her and she goes, what are you talking about? It seems so giant in my mind. She hadn't noticed it at all. And even after I pointed it out, she still was, I still don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I guess I see it, but who cares? Yeah. And so it's funny yeah. how our perception of us is so different than other people's perception of us. Look, I'll, I'll say it this way. There are some people, my wife hopefully included, who for some reason like what they see when they look at me. I look in the mirror and I don't have any frame of reference for that. I don't think that I'm ugly or particularly unattractive, but I don't, but I just don't, I literally don't care. And, but I find it very, so I find it interesting when yeah. there's people who look and they like it because I look in the mirror and I don't see what they see. I'm not going to argue with them. Yeah, but look at but, your beautiful hair. Just oh, look at that. Well, that's why that's why Lena married me. It's, it's all about the hair. It's all uh, about the hair. <laughs> she has she has very she has similar hair. And if we had children, they would have had the greatest hair in, in the history of humanity. But yeah. we we did we elected not to do that just because we knew it would be such a burden for them. That's great. I love it. We always have a great conversation. I have all the time in the world for you. I do want to do this because your shoes are so phenomenal. If okay, somebody, 
Well, I mean, if somebody was listening to this podcast and they said, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a chance on these. I'm going to buy myself a pair of zero shoes. What is the beginner, the first one you would recommend? Mm, I'd recommend you buy them all because, you know, daddy's got to feed people. I don't have a good answer, which is why we have a shoe finder quiz on our website. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're walking, that's different than running, that's different than lifting weights, that's different than casual wear, that's different than if you need something for winter versus summer. So I don't have a really good answer. You I'll have tell a quiz. You, that's, that's a good answer. You yeah. Have a quiz. So if you go to zeroshoes.com, you will find uh, X-E-R-O shoes. Although if you type in Z-E-R-O, it'll still get to us. Then you will find our shoe finder quiz in a number of places. We're redesigning the website to make that more visible. But regardless, you'll find it. And, you know, give that a whirl. I know the best-selling shoes for different categories and some different use cases, but I don't want to give one recommendation because fundamentally all of our shoes are the same. Lightweight, foot-shaped, low to the ground, no heel lift, no whatever, really flexible, really lightweight. And our soles are made to be both give you protection and traction, but also ground feedback. And they're backed with a 5,000-mile sole warranty. Most Mm. shoes, they say they wear out in two to 500 miles. When we designed the rubber for our shoes... We wanted to make something more durable. And interestingly, the, the shoe rubber manufacturer that we connected with said, but that's not how they make the outsole rubber for shoes. And I went, yeah, no shit. That's why we're we going to do it this way. We're not going to make something that's got planned obsolescence. Our, our sustainability story is that we're using fewer materials and it takes less energy to put our shoes together as a result. We make things last longer so they stay out of landfills longer. And we're always looking for better materials, but there aren't really many that actually are carbon beneficial. In fact, there are pretty much none that are carbon beneficial. There are some that are trash beneficial. So like doing recycled plastic is great for the trash world, but it's really not doing much for the carbon world, if you will. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about that in the world right now. So we're always looking for better stuff, but we're never going to do anything where we're saying that we're being more helpful to the planet than we actually are. Unlike most companies in the world right now. I do have one more one more question about, because I saw that you mentioned something on your site about flat feet. People saying, oh, it, well, is it good for yeah. me to wear barefoot shoes if I have flat feet or? Mm-hmm. So I had lifelong comedy level flat feet. I mean, literally, I was the butt of jokes from my family. And I started going barefoot and wearing the sandals that we originally made in shoes eventually. But before I even got to the shoes, because that took us a few years, I noticed my foot changing shape. And arch height is predominantly genetic, like 90% genetic, but it'll be influenced by strength. And strength is more important than structure in this case. And the way, again, you get strong is by using your feet. So my feet became a little shorter, a little wider. And when my feet were really flat, on the inside part of my foot near the heel, there was like a piece that kind of came out and made my, if I stepped out of a pool or a hot tub, made my footprint kind of oval looking. Now my footprint looks like a footprint, but not with like a massive arch cut out, but it looks like a foot instead of a oval with a couple of little ovals around it. And so we've heard stories like that. We haven't, there's not a study that proves that that happens. So again, I say, but it doesn't really matter. Having higher arches is not magic. I don't know where the idea of flat feet being bad came from. I have to look into that. But on the contrary side and the flip side, People with high arches, strength is still important, but they're usually a little hypertonic. They're usually just a strength. What's the word I'm looking for? How do you say hypertonic without saying hypertonic? They're usually a contracted more than they need to be, more, more habitually. And yeah. so what they need to do is work on a little bit of flexibility as well, just get a little mobility in there. But strength is important used when you need it. So you want to be able to relax when you need to relax, be strong when you need to be strong. So for people with high arches, hypertonic, they need to work on the relaxation part. And the proper use of a strength, that again comes from using your feet naturally. Interesting. They're like an adaptogen for your feet. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. Is there any place that someone can go to to try on your shoes or is it all online? We're in, oh boy, we're in about 500 stores worldwide. But the challenge there, if you go to our website up in the upper right-hand corner is a store locator link. Click on that, see what you can do. We're opening up new accounts literally multiple times a week. And the the pro- companies that we currently work with, we include REI and a number of others, they're getting inventory now. So it's going to be the next few weeks to a month as the stores bring in the spring and, and summer inventory. 
Fantastic. Did I miss yeah. anything? Is there anything about barefoot shoes that we didn't cover? The simplest thing I can say is that there are a lot of companies that are kind of jumping on the bandwagon and making shoes that they're calling minimalist or calling barefoot that aren't. So, and um, uh, I was on a call yesterday with someone who's designed a new shoe and he came up with new language to describe why his shoes are still barefoot, even though they're nothing close to it. And so you, what you want to look for, so back to Irene Davis, who, when she was at Harvard, she described something as minimalist and partial minimalist. And the partial minimalist shoes she discovered are worse for you than anything else you could wear because they're not giving you enough feedback to make you naturally adapt to a more natural gait. And because of that, you're putting yourself in biomechanically unsound positions along the way. And so the difference, I, I'll have to talk about what makes a partial minimalist shoe. And I actually accused her of being politically correct. I said, if you weren't being politically correct, wouldn't you say real minimalist and fake minimalist? And she said, yeah. So and that's on my podcast. So a partial minimalist shoe will not be wide enough for either your toes or maybe even your instep. There's a company, I mentioned it, Merrill makes a number of shoes they're calling barefoot. And while they are very low in the cushioning side, I can't get them on my feet. They're too narrow around the mid, the midfoot. So you want something that's wide enough to let your toes not get squeezed together, wide enough so it's not squeezing your, your midfoot together. You don't need arch support. If you're wearing orthotics, our shoes are the best platform for it because they're totally flat and they're not getting in the way. Right. But you'll find that, you, that as you build up strength, you might be able to get rid of them entirely or most of the time. So low to the ground, flat from ball to your foot to your heel, no excessive cushioning, doesn't squeeze your toes together, flexible. So you can have something that's really thin, but still not flexible. Yeah. It still gives you some feedback. When you put them on, if you walk on a mildly weird surface, pea gravel, not like big, thick rocks that are pointing out like crazy, it should feel like a foot massage instead of feeling nothing. If it's something where it's big, sharp rocks, you're going to feel that because they're big, sharp rocks. We amazingly have not figured out how to violate the laws of physics. Still working on it, but not there yet. So that's the, those are kind of the highlights for what you want to look for. And other than that. And you've um, just covered all those with zero. If they go to yeah. zero, they're going to get a real barefoot shoe. Yeah. We're in Irene Davis's research. She listed three brands and one additional product. So it's us. There's a company out of the UK called Vivo Barefoot. Although, well, anyway, we've had a lot of people who've been worn both and tend to prefer ours for various reasons. Sometimes prefer theirs for the look and feel, mostly for the look. They make some really not inexpensive more dressy shoes than what we're currently making. We're yeah. trying to keep things really affordable. And then Vibram, the five fingers, those toe shoes, but not all of them. I've seen people still have bad form in those because they're not getting enough feedback. And then one shoe from another company they stopped making five years ago, so it's not worth bringing up. And then everything else was on her partial minimalist list. Well, that's great. I'm sure people will appreciate your openness to share that. And off the top of my head, I was always looking at the Bebo Barefoot and then I found you at the conference and then I... Yeah. put on the speed force and I'm like, that's my shoe. Done. That's my, Done. that's my damn shoe. <laughs> I love it. 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 I just realized something funny that the speed force, I developed that with a guy that I mentioned, the guy who was at Nike, who was talking to the doctor and said, Hey, what do you think? That guy was, he had a 15 point treatise on how to make shoes that allowed human feet to function naturally. And he said, Nike has done one and a half of them and they'll never do any more. Well, I'd bring that up because he and I designed the speed force together. Hmm. So it was Fantastic. really his idea. I've got, the, I've got the pattern right over there on my table because I'm, I'm going to give away, I'm going to give away a joke because I can't keep secrets. For April Fool's, I'm making the ultimate sustainable shoe. So it's a version of the Speed Force made out of fruit leather. <laughs> nice. So you nice. can run in it and then when and you're then done running, it. you can eat it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, look, Stephen, I am a fan of your shoes and I imagine that I will just always have pairs. I'm always like, I want a fresh backup pair when these get flown <laughs> out, but they, they seem to be holding up really well for as much mileage as I'm putting on them. I yeah. go to the gym with them all the time. I always say this when I make any sort of review for you guys, I always say your feet will thank you. And <laughs> I, I really mean that because there's no reason to have foot pain unless you walked 25,000 steps today. You should even then, not. Oh, no, even then I did, I did 15 miles in New York city in the speed force. Totally fine. Awesome. Well, that's good. Cause next time I'm in New York, I tend to walk a ton. So I'm just going to use the speed force. I, I love them, man. I really do. I'm urging everyone to just give it a shot. Your feet deserve 
better experience than people that are just feeding you these these blocks and casts and creating hammer toes and shortening your Achilles yeah, and all look, that stuff. Look, here, 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 here's the other thing that motivates me. The big shoe companies know what they do doesn't work. They know it. I may have said it. We've had people say straight to our face, what you're doing is legit. We can't do it because it would be admitting we've been lying for 50 years. They know it. They just can't do anything else. And no one, and the reason that the, the stories they've been telling have caught on so well and stuck so well is there were no other real options for the last, well, till 10 years ago for the, yeah. for 40 years before that. And that's two generations. That's enough where you don't need to keep advertising. Everyone believes you now. So that it's a whole different world now. Yeah. And happily we're seeing that not just for us, more brands coming in, doing similar things, which we're ecstatic about. And again, if you just look at the data, more and more people getting interested in this in an organic way, because they're bumping into people who've had the experience that you're describing. And it doesn't feel like a fad at that point. It's, oh, and again, it all makes sense. Stronger is better than weaker. Moving is better than immobility. Feeling is better than numbness. Po proper posture is better than jacking it up. I mean, none of this is complicated. That's perfect. I think that is a nice way to put the cherry on this podcast. Perfect. Steven, it's, yeah, it's been, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Quite. It's great to have met a fellow gymnast. I, I look Absolutely. forward to seeing your, your shoe company take off into the stratosphere and take advantage of the fact that these people have been lying to everybody and let's get that information out there. And for anyone listening, telling you, you will not regret buying a pair of zero <laughs> shoes, xero.com. Take the quiz nope. and find well, yourself. xeroshoes.com, xero.com. Oh, okay. com. That'll take you to an accounting software. So, oh, yeah. um, forget that. So, X, so. Yeah. Xero shoes or at zero shoes or slash zero shoes, wherever you at or slash. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Stephen, for coming on and giving Pleasure. us the, the rundown on, on Barefoot. I think people are armed. They know what to do now. And uh, thank you for listening. And we will catch you on the next one. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks.